Hello, dear friends. We are sincerely happy to welcome you again. Today we will have a conversation with the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. Greetings. Igor Mikhailovich, in the previous video we talked about the true miracle, and you said that the human oneself is exactly the greatest miracle. And the real miracle is the freedom of a person's choice, the choice that every person makes while being half inevitably alive and half inevitably dead. This is exactly the choice which is given to us from God. And you said that we choose every day between living and rejoicing or, on the contrary, experiencing pain and sufferings. You know, in this regard, one already understands why some monks used to say that the list of sins should actually be supplemented with such a sin as low mood. It seems to many people that it is something that doesn't depend on them at all, that it cannot be controlled in any way. Thus, there is the following question. Is this really so? And is mood something that can and should be worked on? Or… Let's begin with simple things. What gives a mood to a person? Really, my friends, what elevates your mood? What makes you joyful, content and cheerful? Well, everyone has something of their own. Right. For some people, it is material income. For others, it is some kind of success. Yes, for someone, it's impressions. Impressions, right. While for others, it's a good movie or something else. However, all this is short-term, isn't it? Everything passes. You get used to everything. Meanwhile, what makes a person truly happy? Only this inner joy. God's love, friends. God's love. If a person is filled with it, he cannot be despondent. He is always in joy. He is always in love. He is always happy. That is why saints used to say, it's a sin for a human to be in despondency. Right? Right. Why, my friend? When you are in sadness, when you are worried, it means Satan reigns over you. People say, when can we have fun? There are so many problems. We are not talking about having fun. Fun is also from the evil one. We are talking precisely about God's love and inner happiness. Well, some people might say, especially in the current situation, there are so many problems and everything else, what happiness can you talk about? Some people can say so, can't they? You should be compassionate and sad. When there is misery around, problems only escalate. And everyone in their life might have a situation that can be very difficult at times. Is it really happiness? But I'll put it this way, friends. When you are filled with God's love, no matter what happens around you, even with your family and friends and with your body, you will be happy anyway. Happy because… because you are in contact with the spiritual world and because God already knows you personally. Isn't it happiness? Isn't this beautiful? And isn't it a reason for good mood, so to say? It is. While everything else… Well, yes, there are problems or something else. There are. But when a person succumbs to, say, temptations or this kind of intimidation from consciousness, that's when panic begins, along with problems and whatnot. Excuse me. Consciousness exaggerates and intimidates you so much with simple things which don't even concern and won't ever concern you, that a person is neither in joy nor in sorrow. He is nowhere at all, wanting to crawl under the baseboard like a cockroach and sit there without looking out at the bright sunshine. Isn't that so? Right. To lose the will to succeed on the way to the goal. To life. To life, right. Certainly. And also, there is such a state in which a person is neither in joy nor in sorrow, none at all, there's nothing good either. When a person is totally indifferent, as they say, he has an even mood, it isn't even, he is nowhere. It also happens in a state when a person is already dependent to such an extent that he is tired of being afraid. But he has no strength to resist. 
so he already gives up. And then he is neither fish nor flesh. You know, Igor Mikhailovich, once when people shared how they felt when they were depressed, they described this very state you are talking about. They said, I want to return to life so much. And I wondered what they would say, what does it mean to return to life? And they said, at least to experience some emotional state. Of course. That is, a person is nowhere to such an extent. Already depressed, right. To such an extent, he feels nothing internally being in this state. And now it is clear that this is actually a very strong It's a tough state, but it's not just tough, it reeks of hopelessness, you know? To such a degree, a person is in despondency. Apathy towards this life and the pointlessness of doing anything Of course, it's hard. A person drives himself into this by chasing after other people's attention. And afterwards, he doesn't know how to get out of that. Why? Because the system drains him, and he is literally like an empty bucket. He is good for nothing. Igor Mikhailovich, I would also like to talk about the chemistry of mood, about how scientists describe how hormones affect our mood, our emotional state. You know, even some of our viewers note such a thing, especially those who have diseases associated with disorders of their hormonal profile, in particular thyroid gland diseases and so on. That it seems to them that now, for a certain period of time, they feel great joy, some kind of amazement in silence. Life is simply full of colors. But then suddenly a state of aggression occurs, and people succumb to that state. Afterwards, a feeling of guilt and regret comes that they succumb to this state of aggression. And then, of course, the question arises, do hormones affect, let's say, emotions and consciousness, or is it actually the other way around? I'll put it simply. Both consciousness with its thought can cause some hormonal changes. And hormones can contribute to a certain mood, that very despondency, that very fear, well, some kind of subjective, let's say, sort of sensations, right? But let's start with simple things, friends. Our entire hormonal surge lasts for no longer than 90 seconds. Great. Nearly 90 seconds, that's the maximum. A hormone doesn't work beyond that. A question arises. Why? Why does a person lose his temper for so long, for more than 90 seconds? Absolutely right. Indeed, 90 seconds, a minute and a half passed, and there is no longer a chemical reaction in him, regardless of whether he has a problem with a thyroid gland, anything. It doesn't matter. But why is a person angry for so long? Why does a person worry or get emotional for so long? What is the reason, friends? Who prolongs this state, right? Absolutely right. And is there actually such a thing that hormones, let's say, splashed out, combined, and a person's mood begins to change every two minutes, from one extreme to another, and so on. And he cannot do anything about it because of his hormones. He simply heard it, probably from someone who shared their hormonal state, became impressed, repeated it, and reinforced that skill in himself. And in this case, health has nothing to do with it at all. Even if a person has a problem with a thyroid gland, a high sugar level, or something else, yes, there can be a deterioration of the work of consciousness. Why? It all affects the brain, a connection is broken, and the person no longer perceives this world, let's say, so clearly. Somewhere it is more difficult to solve some task, something else, and he feels as personality that his consciousness has weakened. It can happen, no question. In some cases, let's say, our body perceives a high sugar level as a threat, or again, as a result of hormonal changes in the thyroid gland, there was a surge. And a person feels kind of a sensation or sort of a syndrome of anticipation of something bad arises. Heart patients also often experience a kind of premonition, premonition. as they call it. But all this premonition at the level of hormones lasts no more than, I'm saying it again, 90 seconds, no more. While a person walks around, worries, anticipates something, and so on. Again, associatively, at the level of his consciousness, he identified this state of hormonal surge as some kind of threat. But why not as a hormonal surge? A simple question. 
But there's something happening at the level of metaphysics. <laughs> Surely, of course. Some kind of metaphysics, and yet another prophet of some kind wakes up in a person who starts saying, since I feel bad, something will happen. Everything in the world is bad, or… Or something will happen to somebody, or something else. And he is like the center of the earth, of the universe, you know? And something happened somewhere out there, on the next arm of our galaxy, and I can feel that, right? Guys, you should be mature. What can be said here? I'll put it simply, friends. What you pay for, that's what you get. And thanks to this information that you mentioned, that actually from the moment of the emergence of a thought to this washing out of a hormonal response or removing it from the body, 90 seconds pass. And you understand that there is a Chinese proverb which says that if you are angry, count to 10, but if you are very angry, then count to 100. And it turns out that this count to 100, in fact, takes about 90 seconds, which help you live through the search. You know, Chinese acupuncture helps a lot. Indeed, when you experience such hormonal surges, when you become engrossed in an emotion, you take, let's say, that very toothpick, poke it into some sore spot and hold it there for a hundred seconds, and everything will go away. Why? Because all your attention, my friend, will go to the point you pressed. Just don't press, you know, in the eye or somewhere else. Spare your health. Let it still serve for the future. However, that switches your attention very well. And after 15 seconds, you begin to understand that it is simply a hormonal surge, that it affected your perception a little bit. Now it will pass, yes. But in no way is it some kind of premonition, anticipation or whatever else, right? All this turns out to be very simple and easy to stop. Also, Igor Mikhailovich, you said that a person, for example, has heard about the symptoms in another person and tried them on himself. Right, mirror neurons do play a role. Here you go. But it turns out that since their childhood, a lot of people have been told such a mindset that they are sort of morbid or mindsets regarding their character. For example, you are stubborn, you are a Capricorn, so it's useless to argue with you and so on. People accept those attitudes Certainly. and basically live in accordance with they them. They are proud of that afterwards. And justify their behavior. Of course. For instance, a person commits wrong actions and stubbornly believes that he's a Capricorn. So he is supposed to act this way. A ram means a ram. Well, can you deal with such a person since he's just a ram? Not because he's a Capricorn by his zodiac sign, but because he has bought such a negative behavior an attitude towards life, with his own attention and his own life. Isn't that true? As you said, one should remember that there are no animals in heaven. Absolutely. Yes, that one should actually change something in one's life. Right. People should become humans and stop being rams, donkeys and all the rest. Yes. Humanity is humanity. It's not a zoo. But it is us who turn it into a zoo by considering ourselves to be either a ram or a horse. Well, isn't that true? Are those our totem animals or what? There is also another point, Igor Mikhailovich, regarding mindsets. They particularly arise among people who follow the spiritual path or actually embark on this path. There is such a mindset that a sound mind is in a sound body and vice versa. If one's spirit is sound, then one's body should be sound as well. A question arises. Good. Tatiana. I also have a question. There are even many questions. A great many. Name me at least one of those true saints who was healthy. Which of them? On the contrary, many of them actually experienced huge problems with their bodies. But people want it otherwise. This point arises too, and many people looking at the experience of those saints say, basically, the more problems I have with my body, the purer and holier I will become too by going through those diseases well, and sufferings. Well, to put it simply, it is much easier to escape from Satan's paws that way, isn't it? When the body is already on the verge, a person becomes more free. Tentatively speaking, do our sins always influence our health? And do they influence it at all? Sins or diseases? More likely, it is perhaps the internal mental health that influences physical health. Aha! Uh -huh. The mental one, yes. It can influence behavior and health. It surely can. Again, there is a nocebo effect. If we start loading ourselves with diseases, we will never recover. You know, there are people who undergo treatment all their lives. 
Oh, yes. The goal of their life existence is new methods of treatment. They do not need health. They need treatment. Exactly. And with their attention, at the cost of their own lives, they buy new methods of treatment for themselves because they are sick. In the past, there was such a method of treatment. It was really applied. Mainly, in mountainous regions, a person was given a heavy stone and forced to carry it very far into the mountains. A person was going to die, but they made him do that. Do you know what's interesting? In 99% of cases, when a person descended from the mountain, he was healthy. Great. Of course it's great. You know, I've just recalled that in medicine, physicians who work with cancer patients have a practice of determining the prognosis of a cancer patient. A lot of people think that maybe it is based on metastasis, how they are localized, or what response to chemotherapy a patient has. The stage, for example, right? And I was very surprised that it is determined by how a person moves, whether he goes to the store, whether he brushes his teeth, whether he takes an active part in his life. Because, as it turns out, if a person becomes bedridden and believes that this is the end for him, then no medical care can actually help him. But when a person has a goal, as in the example you gave about a sick person who was sent with a stone to surmount this… You know, just now, you reminded me of a case. It's a case from life. A man who was already in his sixties, was diagnosed with cancer. He tried to get treatment, but in the end, all treatment methods were unsuccessful. He was already in the hospital with multiple metastases, and the doctors honestly said that he had two, maybe three weeks left at most. He was barely able to walk. It was very hard for him to stand up and take even two steps to the toilet and so on. But an accident occurred. His son and daughter-in-law died, and his granddaughter was left with her sick grandmother, that is, his wife, who was seriously ill too. She had blood pressure problems and diabetes, so the situation was very difficult. And this man decided, since I'll die anyway, I'll go help my wife, at least a little bit. I'll look after my granddaughter and watch her. And here's further development of this story through the doctor's eyes. My friend told me that a few years passed and this granddad showed up. He showed up. <laughs> and here's the funniest part. He finally came for a checkup, you see? He said, when will I die? And it wasn't a resurrection. <laughs> no, it wasn't a resurrection, no. I see. A vigorous, normal man came and said, I would still like to have a checkup because it oppresses me that I might die while I have plans to help my granddaughter and so on. They examined him and said, it feels like the person was sick, but then he simply became healthy as if something removed the disease. They started questioning him, what did you do? He said, nothing. I came home, it was hard. The first thing I gave up was the medications, because what's the point for me in prolonging these torments? And he said, he had a stash of homemade alcohol, the so-called moonshine, infused with various herbs. He said, since I was going to die anyway, and I was at home, it was night. So. I had a couple of glasses for the night. I didn't take it in the morning because I had to help my wife and granddaughter. So the man was busy and took a magic homemade potion. No one knows what helped him. Maybe it was placebo or maybe the potion he had. But he returned a few years later to confirm that he was healthy. The doctors told him, for now, you are not going there anytime soon. These are facts from life. That's great because completely unexplainable by medicine. These are really some kind of we talked about some kind of miracles. Indeed, if a person has a goal, then even the most miraculous scenarios are possible. Absolutely right. As they appear to us in this three-dimensional life. Well, he started a different life, stopped buying his own death and so on. And this is the key question from our viewers. And he found a goal. Exactly. The goal towards which he needed to go. And this is the most important thing. I'll say a simple thing. Do you know why many people tritely do not succeed in prayer practices? I don't even mention the spiritual ones. 
It's simply because they have God knows what in their heads. Their emotions fluctuate, just like we discussed with you, from anger to laughter. While a person is in prayer, and a lot of things pop up in his head about what he needs to do, while a person reads a prayer, after all. Do you know why? Why? Because a person doesn't have a goal. Exactly. There is actually no spiritual so, goal. of course. Deceiving that he allegedly follows the spiritual path, right? Self-deception. Well, you know, some kind of a surge occurs. Something encourages a person to really engage in his spiritual development. So the person makes a choice. He goes to a church or a synagogue. It doesn't matter. Depending on the religion, that he or most people around him are related to. So he begins to follow a spiritual path, while afterwards it becomes routine. He doesn't give it up, but it's routine. All these things become a formality. Absolutely right. It's the same as going out with friends once a week, you see? For instance, he goes to a church in the morning, while in the afternoon he goes to play poker with his friends and drink beer, you see? That's how routine it all becomes. That's why there is no advancement, there is no, let's say, changes in a person's life. It's all just like, as people say, ordinary life, you know? What does ordinary life mean? That's the expression I've always liked the most. Sometimes you ask, how are you? Well, just in ordinary life. I'm living as always. As always? What does that mean? In no way. The Groundhog Day, like a squirrel in a wheel. It's the same as yesterday. Of course, do you know how a human should live? He should live better and better every day and every moment. If there is no improvement every moment of your life, my friend, you are not living. You are just being exploited. Just like a slave. Like a donkey. Who, let's say, is overdriven with loads for the rest of its days. Is that really life? If you have no improvement and no… Dynamics of this inner growth, right? Absolutely right. And by what is it measured? By happiness, by life. That is, precisely by the purity of love, which you not only give, but also receive. I understand that many have problems, and not everyone can even feel what love is, but one should strive for that. You see, there is no such thing that if a person sets himself a real goal, he would not achieve it. There is no such thing anywhere, neither in sports, nor in life, or in business, unless an accident or some circumstances independent of him can interrupt all that. But if a person sets himself a goal, he will surely achieve it. For me, it was a very edifying example, which you once gave about two people sparring, one of whom was a novice athlete, and the other was a master of sports. And how? Well, I told you a lot of examples. Yes, and I was really very much impressed by this example of determination, let's say, uh -huh. of a novice wrestler. I get it. It's exactly about a person who set a goal. Yes. Yes, we had such a conversation, and I once told you about that. Well, let's tell our friends too, since you were impressed, and now you've found it all in your knowledge base. Maybe it will also help people. What does it mean to indeed set a goal, which you're really striving for? It must be the goal of your entire life, the meaning of your existence, my friend. A simple example. It's not about spiritual development, but it's about human capabilities. Some time ago, we were engaged in sports. We had a club. It was quite popular, as people say, even too popular. The point is that not only athletes came to us, but also people from the street, as always, friends of friends, acquaintances of acquaintances. And we had a young guy, about 19 years old or so, who was a nice guy, but a street kid. Just to make it clear, he lived according to the rules of the street, but he had never had anything to do with sports. But when he saw how his friend had changed, naturally, he also wanted to. However, we practiced precisely in the sports complex, with a lot of other gyms let's say, other clubs of different sports, and literally door-to-door -door with a common locker room, judo wrestlers practiced. There was a leading athlete there. He was a master of sports, 
He was a master of sports in judo. He was their leading athlete and a candidate for master of sports in boxing. At that time, he was 28 years old, a young guy. We knew each other well. And he had this, you know, caustic sarcasm. He wasn't mean, but he nitpicked people so much, you know, there are such people, they don't mean any harm, but for some reason you want to, well, how to put it mildly, generally speaking. To yank them. Yes, to yank. And sometimes you very much want to yank at their tongue, but they do not do it out of malice. These are simply that kind of people. Let's put it so. And it turns out that we were used to him, to this master of sports, but that young street kid, and in the locker room they faced… his first experience of communicating with this master of sports. Yes, in the locker room he met this master of sports for the first time. And so this young boy reacted to the sarcasm of this master of sports. Well, it's natural that… He got angry. To put it mildly. Why? Because according to street standards, one cannot talk like that. So, it almost came to a clash, so I interfered and said, Stop, guys. I said, First of all, one of you has no chance, no chance at all, no matter how we approach it. While to the other one I said, You'll be ashamed. How can you bully him? It's the same as if you go to kindergarten and start fighting children. The level of a master of sports and a man who had nothing to do with sports at all, Yes, he kicked on the street, but, excuse me, when there is already a professional and… After all, there is a technique, yes, there are certain tools. The advantages were huge, and the weight category of the master of sports was a little bit higher. The anthropometric indicators were somewhat similar, but the master of sports had more mass, and not fat mass at that. That's why the chances were zero. I saw that young guy flew off the handle, and I suggested a compromise. I said, listen, don't be too hot. If you want to, let's do the following. I suggest three months of your training. We prepare you, give you the initial base, and you go for a spar, not empty-handed. Surely, if the Master of Sports agrees, the Master of Sports said, even a year of training, go ahead. That kid said, I'm ready. I said, it's good that you are ready, but I told him, beware, training will be tough. If you really want to not embarrass yourself, but to stand at least one round with dignity. We agreed. Well, at that time, there was no such thing as ultimate fighting, MMA and the like, but we agreed somehow in this perspective. Freestyle. In other words, a mixture. Right. Or, to put it simply, street fighting, okay? The skills are embedded in any case. These are reflexes which one person has trained for years, while the other one got punched in the nose in the back alley once in five years. Well, there's a difference. So this young kid said, I'm ready. I wondered how ready he was, so I loaded him. I'll also mention that many people still remember our club was extremely popular sometimes. You came into the gym and there was no room to stand, let alone to practice. When you gave a workout the next day, half of the gym was empty. So I gave him a workout, sometimes even unnecessary and excessive, just to break him psychologically. I wondered where his threshold was. I liked the fact that the guy didn't break down. He endured everything with dignity. He really had a goal not to embarrass himself, not to run away, not to embarrass himself, but at least to go for a spar. So he practiced for three months and went to spar after three months. Do you know how long their sparring lasted? About six seconds. Oh, there you go. The master of sports fell down unexpectedly. After he got up, his head cleared and he said, it was an accident. Accident. He immediately said, it was an accident. Of course. This is impossible. He said, one more time. And the young man said, let's do it. The master of sports endured already for about a minute. Then he got up, shook his hand, and they became good friends. The point of this whole story is that if a person really sets himself a goal, if he really and truly sets it without playing around, and if this is the most important goal in his life, he will achieve it. 
You know, what I remember is that you once said that this master of sports came to training and he teased and laughed yes, at some point, he teased. but that didn't stop the young man. And for me, although you said that this story doesn't really have much to do with the spiritual, it does not. there is such a serious parallel with the inner work on oneself. Nothing affects you, neither criticism nor ridicule of people around you. And here, you are absolutely right. Despite the fact that this master of sports came and trolled him for three months, while the guy had no right to react because it was in agreement, he wasn't afraid of either excessive workout or pain or anything else. He acquired the skills, he came and won. Anyone can win. Yet, do you know why the master of sports lost? Why? Due to arrogance. Self-conceit, right? He was too relaxed. He didn't change either his training regime or anything else. Everything he saw when he came, while that guy was training, all he saw was the basic technique and repetition. In reality, we trained him to perform two counter holds in judo, not holds, but counter holds in judo, and merely two punches in boxing. That's it. We had three months, so we couldn't do more. But we trained the guy until he had a reflex. And that worked. Well, understandably, there's a bit of chess here too. If that master of sports hadn't had such a high opinion of himself, the guy wouldn't have any chance. He simply wouldn't have it. I also remember very well how you said that boxing is the art of evading an attack. Of course. And this is such a great parallel with one's work on one's side. Well, Again, what the art of evading an attack means, just to make it clear, if a person sets a stiff block and a hitter with a weak punch works against him, not even a knockouter, just to make it clear, while the person is defending himself, doesn't step back and doesn't attack, then even that hitter, even with a weak punch, would knock him down anyway. Why? Because due to the frequency of punches, concussion is transmitted even through the block. A person would still lose his balance, and he can even fall asleep in the middle of the ring. While in order to avoid that, he should quickly change his position. The same is true for the spiritual plane, as it turns out. Absolutely. And look, everything is fractal, isn't it? If the system attacks you while you just… well, thoughts attack you have a bad mood, or something else. Misfortune is everywhere, and you listen to it and succumb. Hence, you are actually in a stiff block, my friend. And the system itself punches you. It will beat you up, and you won't get away anywhere. What should you do? Change your position. That's right. Step aside. Switch over. And let the system pass by. Then victory will be yours. Yet, if we also apply this to the subject, in the same way we touched upon the subject of health, and what kind of mindsets a person buys for himself. Sure. After all, our participants also say that, indeed, very often, I don't know, having recovered from one disease, we immediately get a new one. One hundred percent. How to break this chain? In the same way, as it turns out, one should stop buying those diseases and redirect attention. If a person… there's one point here. If a person sets a goal for himself to be healthy, the system draws him into an endless whirl of various treatment methods in pursuit of health. Yes, exactly. Friends of mine, that's where this vicious circle is broken very easily. Set yourselves a goal to live. To live. Not health, but to live. Great. You can defeat anyone but the devil. It's impossible to defeat him because he's a part of this world and a part of you. You can fight against anyone. Try to fight against yourself. Would you twist your left hand with your right one? Or what? Or will you punch yourself in the face? Right, basically kill yourself, such a self-destruction. But isn't that so? Is it not what we do? Sometimes we do it all day long. Don't we destroy ourselves and our own life? Don't we deprive ourselves of life? Don't we cancel our future out by paying with our own lives on a daily basis for the harm that we do to ourselves? Isn't this true, friends? After all, it's true. Although we know and understand that we do the wrong thing. Yes, those who don't know may be forgiven. But what about those who know? Those who listened to us, those who turned on their brains and analyzed what saints spoke about. 
those who understand the very mechanism of this world order and nevertheless continue doing harm to themselves. How can this be explained? With what? Nothing, except slavery. Well, if a person is already a slave and he has accepted that, it is his choice. We can only sympathize in this case. We can sympathize with the unfledged little angel who is so weak and his consciousness is so fierce like, you know, a wild wolf has gnawed at a chicken. Nothing can be done in this case. Also, Igor Mikhailovich, we touched a little bit upon holy fathers of the Church. You know, some holy fathers of the Church used to say that, in fact, all ordeals, diseases, and so on are even some kind of God's grace. In particular, the elder Pisios said that at the moments of suffering and diseases, he received more benefit in the spiritual sense than over his entire ascetic experience before the disease. Right. And many people say that when the external human suffers, the internal one is, on the contrary, renewed. Certainly. And why, why does, does this happen? happen? You and I even said in unison, why does this happen? As a matter of fact, many of our friends also noted yes, exactly. and talked about this. When our body gets sick, the system loosens the pressure, and a human as personality gains more freedom. Meanwhile, excuse me, no matter how sick the body is, even if it is dying and decaying, it doesn't matter. As long as there is personality, and personality has direct contact with the soul. Pardon me, illness doesn't affect this contact, neither personality nor the soul. It affects the body and the interconnection with consciousness. And here's the key point, the interconnection with consciousness. When a person is ill, especially severely ill, the pressure or domination over personality by his consciousness becomes weaker. And that's when practices really begin to work much better. So, in essence, a person is not deprived no. in the spiritual sense. This mechanism. And for him, it is actually even a greater opportunity. This mechanism is actually embedded for those who have walked all the way and are just a step away from the finish line, but they no longer have strength. So, this very mechanism is intended for a person to be able to leap, you know, for the leap. After all, over the years, people also often have health troubles, so to say, and many lose their health. Of course. So, it turns out to be sort of an accumulation for this spiritual leap to a certain extent. Everything is balanced. That's interesting. Yet, why do people have such different attitudes towards a disease? Because there are those for whom, on the contrary, a disease is an obstacle. It's difficult for them to perform spiritual practices. Certainly. And they fall off and cannot come back afterwards. Because there are people people, people who are free, they feel like, you know, really, like an angel. Such a person feels his wings, he feels every feather of his body. If we talk associatively about the image of an angel which is imposed on us by religious organizations, as a matter of fact, an angel is not a bird, but we use an association with a bird. He is winged with this feeling, winged, right. with this state. So, it doesn't matter. Let a person associatively feel like that angel. He strives to fly up. He strives to throw off these body fetters and break away. For him, it's a chance. But if a person is a slave of consciousness and a disease is an additional burden for him, it suppresses him as personality even more. A person doesn't distinguish and doesn't understand at all that he is personality. If he hasn't been educating himself, if he hasn't been fighting for himself, if he has no practical experience, he considers himself a body that is decaying. And apart from panic, pity, and everything else, there is nothing in that person. Although, I should say that some patients at a certain point, well, even if a person was an atheist, you know, he went to a church for company, or extremely rarely, well, sometimes, when his tummy hurt, he recalled some prayers that his grandmother told him. Actually, as always, you know, this type of a person, but when they get sick, they get the freedom of personality, and it gives them an impetus. So, many people came out of their disease as people 
who stood firmly on the spiritual path, while many, unfortunately, did the opposite. Those are simple examples, and who doesn't know that? Let's say, a lot of people have experienced that, especially with this trendy disease that has nowadays gone around the world, right? You know, how many there are people who are almost dying and doctors already say, zero chance. A person understands that he has zero chance, he is on life support, everything doesn't function, and medications have no effect. There is practically no hope. Doom. Doom. But he is alive. And that's where a lot of people start grasping, you know, like a drowning man at a straw. At least at something, they start looking for God in themselves, that's true, for a way to Him. And they find it. A flash occurs, they literally start, you know, this dialogue with the spiritual world, and a miracle happens, they begin to recover. As soon as their first recovery takes place, and there is a positive dynamics, as soon as doctors say, look, he's got a chance, and this is where people swear to God that they will serve him forever, that their goal is only spiritual, and that's it. And they will be as faithful to the spiritual world as nobody before them. Do you know what the funniest thing is? As soon as symptoms are gone and a person is back to life, he forgets his words. Do you know why? Because the devil is strong, while the person is stupid. But if he knew, it would be better for him to keep quiet. Why? Because the one who swore to God and got results, but afterwards simply cheated God, will be punished twice as much as the one who kept silent. In fact, you saved your body because you chose life, because you were close at that moment. A side effect comes into play in this case, a side effect of this energy surge. I'll put it simply, this is the reason why this delusion appeared. Let's put it politely that a healthy spirit is in a healthy body, right? Or that a healthy spirit gives health to the body, that spirituality heals. I'm just saying what is on people's minds. The spiritual meaning of diseases. Why? When a spiritual surge occurs in a person who has already, excuse me, he has already not just one foot, but a larger part of his body in the grave, then a sudden energy release takes place. A lot is no joke. And that's where his body reserves are activated. And that's it. And the person begins to recover. That's clear. The mechanism is simple. But a person directs this concentrated… Absolutely right. But afterwards, because of human weakness, a person simply forgets the promise he made to God. Why? Things became better. Right? Mm -hmm. That happens far and wide. Why would he strain himself afterwards? He doesn't even remember, he doesn't want to, and he is afraid to recall it. He is afraid to recall it, you know, it's like… So that it wouldn't happen again. So that, God forbid, it wouldn't happen again or something else, and who cares what he said in his delirium, right? Now it at least becomes clear why many holy fathers, even on the contrary, pray to God not to give them healing. But hence, distortions also appear Also that distortions, self-torture and everything if else. If you experience pain and suffering, you become purer and You are holier. spiritual when you torment your own body. How do you become spiritual? Because of what? Because you whip yourself with a birch switch. What is spiritual in this? This is masochism, friends. Excuse me, this is not spirituality. Isn't that true? Well, there are a lot of extremes. Igor Mikhailovich, our viewers also asked for the following advice. Certainly, when the body is ill, when it experiences some difficult states and sometimes consciousness attacks them very strongly, they would naturally want to perform spiritual practices. Yet, their consciousness recommends them to perform, for instance, such practices as the Chetverik or the Pyramid. What else can consciousness recommend to them? Now, let's approach this in a serious way, from the standpoint of physics, okay? A person is intoxicated, his body is ill, he already has a lot of problems, and he starts performing the Chetverik practice. For those who don't know, it is described in the books, including the book Alatra. 
Well, for those who know, let's put it simply, he starts playing with emotions, right? Which… Activate the energy structure. Of course, which will overwhelm him. Will that improve or worsen the condition of a person, a sick person? When so much power is accumulated, sure. such concentration occurs. Of course. The only acceptable practice is the lotus. Just like in the case of diseases, if we take saints, what did they start with? Even those who had been in the Jesus prayer all their life, they enhanced it. Yes, and felt a response. But they enhanced it, not with their tongue, but with feelings. Yes, exactly. It moved from the tongue to the heart, and they already attained this connection with heartfelt prayer. That is why when a person fell sick, it was easier for him, especially when he was severely ill, to perform this prayer exactly with his heart. Well, it is basically that very lotus, so to say. And they regarded that as a tremendous spiritual help. As a gift. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they didn't want to come out of a disease. My friends, whether there is a disease or not, but on the other hand, you know, why get sick in order to become sighted? Well, I do understand. There is an initial experience. Many people, again, consciousness tells some people that they cannot gain an initial experience because… just because they themselves do not know why. There is no reason why they cannot do that, because they do not pay attention. Because, pardon me, they want a freebie, you know? There is such an expression, everything at once, the more the better, and to immediately become a bodhisattva or something else, and a kingdom is given to him to boot. That's how our consciousness works. To find sort of a shortcut. <laughs> 100%. Whereas, if a person really wants, if he feels, if he has an aspiration, and as personality he understands that he's not a sheep, not a ram, and not just a mortal two-legged being, but he's a human, if he feels a need, then there is nothing difficult in learning to love. There is nothing difficult in seeing within oneself the source of this light, fragrance and love, inside the energy structure itself, and simply directing one's love there. And that's in what true Holy Source, the real healing of a human as personality takes place. The life-giving healing, right. And that's what is most important while body diseases should be treated by medical doctors, right? Despondency is a sign of either hypocrisy or slavery. You know, we have again touched upon hypocrisy. Why is exactly despondency a sign of hypocrites? Because they go to church, they are so pious, so truly pious, that they are ready to beat a person with a frying pan because he looked at an icon in a wrong way or something else, or God forbid, he said something, right? They are so pious. Hypocrites. That's why they are in despondency and anger. Whereas when a person lives in God's love, there is joy and happiness in him. He doesn't control someone else but he controls himself. Absolutely right. He controls his consciousness and chooses life. Right. And what happens? When a person is under Satan's power, Satan turns a person into an egoist in the material plane. Everything is mine, my toy, everything. We see how children develop, and from the open and free whom they are just born, let's say, they only begin to communicate a little bit. They are open and kind, but the older a child grows, who manifests in him more? an egoist, with very rare exceptions. Isn't this true? And that egoist, especially supported by parents and friends, who does he become? A slave of Satan. Everything is very simple. Meanwhile, what does exactly spiritual egoism give? Just look at how the system has mirrored it. This very goal, That's right. when you do not pay attention to anything that happens, to nothing, but confidently advance towards your goal. Of course, you generate love and send it to the spiritual world. And what do you get in return? Happiness and joy. And when you live, pardon me, by God's love, then within you a countless number of angels sound in you who sing the most beautiful melody. Isn't that true? How can a person be sad 
when he experiences love sent from the spiritual world, how can he be unhappy if he is in God's love? In no way. When the best interlocutor is next to him, which is love. One hundred percent. Therefore, my friends, let's learn to love. If we do not know how, and let's start with a simple thing, let's love each other. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, friends.